Welcome to Buddha at the Gas Pump. My name is Rick Archer, and my guest this week is Rick Laird. Um, Rick uh, had a spiritual awakening some while back um, in connection with Gangaji, which we'll talk about. And uh, I don't know which order to put these things in, in terms of their significance, but uh, he also used to be the bass player for the Mahavishnu Orchestra during its heyday. And I think that's really cool because I was a musician myself back in those days, um, late 60s, early 70s, playing drums in a lo local rock band. And so for me, in that regard, this is like a, a, a Little League guy interviewing one of the New York Yankees or something. Because you, know? <laughs> you guys were really great. Um, did you uh, did you suffer any hearing loss as a result of being in that group? Um, because you guys were loud. Not really. I mean, you uh, had a reputation for being really loud, you know. It was very loud. Yes, yeah. definitely loud. I actually wore earplugs uh, quite a bit. Oh, that's a good idea. Yeah. Yeah. Because. Uh, yes, it was very loud. And I was actually listening to some of your YouTube videos and. You know, people were raving about how how good you guys were, but they said if you really want to get a sense to what, of what this was like, put on headphones and turn up the volume until your ears bleed. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that's about right. Yeah. yeah. Mm -hmm. But anyway, if anyone's curious to hear a bit of the Mahavishnu Orchestra, if you're not familiar with them, um, look them up on YouTube, and you'll find all kinds of um, videos of of them. Rick standing there with his long hair and white clothing. <laughs> Yeah. So uh, now those guys, I, I was somewhat familiar with them, all, not only in a musical context, but because I was living out in Connecticut at the time in Fairfield County, and I think um, you know Sri Chinmoy had some kind of center out there, and at least John McLaughlin as well as Carlos Santana were into Sri Chinmoy, and I don't know about you or the other band members. Uh, but uh, were you? I mean, was the whole group sort of into Sri Chinmoy or just McLaughlin ma mainly? Uh, it was just McLaughlin. Uh, initially, um, I think he was hoping that we would get involved. Yeah. I was the most likely candidate because uh -huh. uh, I had a little bit of a background, you know, with as a seeker. Right. And. Uh, but John was very, very committed at that time. I mean, Sri Chinmoy, uh, I went to a couple of meetings with him in uh, Queens. They had a little uh, sort of urban ashram, as it were, uh -huh. in Queens, where all the devotees uh, lived. And uh, I went to a couple of meetings and, and a meditation. Uh, he never talked in, in his meditations. He just sat there, mm -hmm. you know and kind of radiated. Um, but I found it a little bit too uh, extreme. Yeah. The, you know, he, he required celibacy. Right. Uh, you know, vegetarianism, you know, all of, all of those kinds of things. And, you know, John was uh, into all that. Right. Uh, I, I wasn't personally, and the other members were not at yeah. all, you know. I kind of did that with my band too. I got them all meditating, all but maybe one or two who weren't really into it, and uh, a few of them were still doing it. And mm -hmm. one of the guys actually went on to become a professional guitar player, John Stoll. I don't know if you've ever heard of him. No, I haven't. No. He's uh, up in the Seattle area, I think, and uh, he's gained somewhat of a worldwide reputation. Mm -hmm. um, anyway, so you mentioned in your bio, uh, which I'll post on BackGap.com, that. Uh, you were first sort of you first sort of got bitten by the spiritual bug when somebody handed you a uh, Krishnamurti book, was it? Yes. Mm -hmm. Before yeah. that, you hadn't given much thought to such things. No, no. I was living in uh, Sydney, Australia, mm -hmm. um, and uh, I was on my way back to England, uh, to London, mm -hmm. and. Uh, I was in a fairly messed up state, you know, I was 21 and, uh, you know, I was a uh, fairly troubled youth, you know. Yeah. But my bass playing career was off to a pretty good start and I figured I'd move to more fertile uh, lands, you know, as so I moved to London. But uh, just before I left, uh, this friend of mine, said, you might want to read this book on the ship. I took a ship which took, uh, five, I think, five weeks wow. 
go from London to England, or from Australia to England. Right. And, uh, so I had lots of time to, uh, to read that book. And uh, I had no idea what he was talking about, <laughs> you know. Yeah. But I knew there was something there that I needed to uh, look into. Huh. I mean, it, you know, it was very clear even at that stage that, wow, this is, uh, this is deep, you know. Yeah. And that was 1962, before kind yes. of before meditation and such things really went mainstream. That's right. Yeah. Yeah. I, was, I was an early adopter, as it were, of Christian, yeah. at least in my generation. So. Huh. Um, and uh, so, uh, you know, throughout the years, I've kind of revisited Krishnamurti. You know, I have several of his books in my, in my library, and I, every now and then I will pull one out and read something. Uh, you know, one of his sayings, the observer is the observed, huh. was one of those early uh, phrases that stuck in my mind, which I had not had no idea what it meant at all, you know. It's a little clearer now. Yeah. You know? And it's one of those, oh, that's what he meant, you know, yeah. but it took years and years and years to see that, you know. Right. Um, so yes, that was that was I would say the beginning, and then uh, so I got established in London as a bass player and uh, the famous jazz club called Ronnie Scotts, which is kind of the main jazz hub in Europe at that time. Mm -hmm. And uh, I think it was 1965. I was going to go to America. I got a scholarship to come to Boston to study music at Berklee School of Music, mm -hmm. and. Uh, there was an ad in the subway in London for the Theosophical Society to teach meditation. Yeah. And this was, you know, yeah, 65, I guess. Uh, the Beatles were in full swing. Right. Uh, I think, I'm not sure if they'd reached their Maharishi stage yet. I think that happened in about 67 or 68. Right. Yeah. That's right. Um, so this was kind of early on. And, uh, you know, so I, I signed up, and it was very simply, I showed up one Sunday morning at a uh, building in Belgravia in London, uh, which is a very fancy neighborhood, and went into this house. Uh, I was met by an Indian gentleman, very formally dressed, uh, British style, not Indian. And we went into a room, and he sat in front of me and simply gave me a mantra. Mm -hmm. Just like that. Just like that, there were no other people around. There was no no ceremony, no ritual. Mm -hmm. It's just bam, bam, bam. This is it. Thank you very much. <laughs> Did he tell you what to do with it? <laughs> yes, basically, you know, twice a day, fifteen minutes to start, uh -huh. and that's all there is to it. Huh. You know, there was no, uh, as far as I recall, there was no follow up. You know, come back and we'll talk about it. You know, yeah, that was it. I think there was some very small fee involved. Mm -hmm. And uh, that was it. But it seemed powerful at the time, you know. Uh, of course, one of the other problems was I was smoking grass, you know, at a fairly uh, hefty yeah. rate in those days. So, you know, to smoke a joint and sit down and meditate was yeah. not really <laughs> right. the right way to go, but seemed cool at the time. Kind of like the elephant, you know, gets in the river, washes itself out, off, and then gets out and throws mud on its back again. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, something like that. <laughs> um, but just, you know, I guess the thing, the thing that I, you know, I've had some time to think a little bit and sort of contemplate what I might say, and of course I didn't want to have a schedule, but... Uh, it seems like the seeking was always there. Yeah. It was always there. there because there was always this sense of dis ease in my life. It was mm -hmm. something that was not quite right, you know. Pretty much from the time you first Pretty re much read the Krishnamurti book. Mean. Exactly. Even bef way before that. I right. Think we right back into uh, school, you know, going to school. I was a troublemaker in school, you yeah. know. I was always being sent to the headmaster's office. Right. I went to school in Dublin, Ireland, mm. which is where I grew up, uh, to a Protestant grammar school. Now, the, the, the significance of that is that uh, in Dublin, 
uh, in, in Southern Ireland, the majority of people were Roman Catholic. Mm. So being a Protestant in that environment was a little weird because we were, I don't know what the percentage was, probably 5% of the people were Protestant. So um, so kids were always trying to beat you up or something? Yes, yes. Yeah. <laughs> of course, I had a uniform because at the, school, the grammar school I went to, we had to wear a blazer and a, a cap and a tie. Yeah. And of course, it's basically screen Protestant, you know. So yeah, there were there were gangs of Catholic youths that would jump jump me and knock me off my bike on the way home, you know. Huh. Um, but yes, I was a troublemaker even then, you know, uh, and a bit of a rebel, you know. So the seeking was always there, and. Uh, I think I was one of the early adopters of LSD too. I had my first experience in 1965. Yeah, that's pretty early. Yeah, yeah. I think uh, Timothy Leary was probably getting into it at that point, but that was that was a bit early. Yeah, it was early. Yeah. He beat it, me by two years. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, it was a very profound experience. I mean, I, I, I I'm not sure I would link it to a spiritual experience as such, but it certainly was. Uh, out of the realm of the norm, you know. Yeah, it, yeah. Pr it probably showed you that, you know, the world could be very different according to how you perceived it, right? I mean, you know, that a lot depended upon how you actually looked at the world. Yes, yes. Uh, and that was my first impression when I, when I did that was like, holy mackerel, because you know, I had always just assumed that things pretty much were as they were, or as they appeared to be. And exactly. then all of a sudden I began seeing it from such a different perspective and I, and I realized, wow, it's all about your perspective, you know. And I remember going into a donut shop in the morning after having been up all night tripping and seeing the ladies serving the donuts and, and kind of realizing that the way they were seeing this room and this experience was so much different than the way I was seeing it. And then I realized that everybody, you know, sees things quite differently, you know. They, we're all walking around with a completely different pair of glasses on, so to speak. And uh, and yet we all kind of m assume that everybody sees things the same. Exactly. <laughs> yeah. Um, but you know, it was a very brief experience. I, I didn't particularly like it. You know, it was. I mean, there was. I didn't like the body feeling. You yeah. know, it was kind of chemical and right. uh, not something I'd want to do a lot of. You know, and I certainly couldn't imagine playing music uh, under the influence. Right. You know. Like Pink Floyd tried to. Uh, yeah, yeah. Well, I mean, dead. Exactly. <laughs> but smoking a J and uh, you know playing was quite normal for me. You know, right. it was no problem. Mm -hmm. um, you know, and of course, bass players are in the back of the group. You're not necessarily in the spotlight. You yeah, know? yeah. So I was playing the upright bass, not the bass guitar, at that mm -hmm. point, and. Uh, you know, so I could kind of stand back there and get a little buzz and just look quite normal. You know, I had a <laughs> nice suit and tie and short hair. Right. Um, uh, so, yeah, the seeking was there. I mean, I, was, I, I couldn't have even said I was a seeker. I didn't even know that much. But in hindsight, I can see that, you know, there was endless seeking, endless looking for something wrong it needs to be fixed, you know. Mm -hmm. Not sure what it is, but it's just something that's not right, you know. Yeah. There was that sense behind everything. And uh, so, uh, fast forwarding, I went to Boston, I went to Berkeley School of Music. Uh, that was uh, my first experience in America. And. Uh, you know, that was 66, uh, the Vietnam War was kind of in full swing and getting going. It was kind of a strange time in America. Yeah. Um, I stayed in Boston for about three years uh, and then mm -hmm. went out on the road with Buddy Rich, the drummer. Oh, cool. Ever heard of him? Oh, yeah. Uh, and eventually, John I actually got arrested in Boston during the time when you were there. Oh, really? Sixty-seven or sixty-eight? Yeah. <laughs> You're the one. <laughs> <laughs> what were you doing that got oh, you? Oh, possession of marijuana. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah, I had one of those later, but we'll get into that. <laughs> so you were playing with Buddy Rich. That's awesome. Playing with Buddy Rich. Yeah. Wow. But uh, uh, as far as the Mahavishnu, John and I. 
uh, had known each other in London mm -hmm. in the 60s with Brian Auger. Right. And uh, we got along very well. You know, we liked each other. I, I loved his guitar playing, and mm -hmm. we kind of grooved. So um, after the Buddy Rich experience, uh, which took me into like uh, mid-1970s, I guess. In case anybody doesn't know, Buddy Rich is considered to be one of the greatest drummers of all time. He and Gene Krupa were like... You know, exactly. in that particular you know generation, they were like cream of the crop, and and often would have battle drum battles with each other and stuff. They were exactly both yeah. fantastic. Yes, they were. Yeah. So um, uh, things in America were getting progressively weirder. You know, Nixon and Agnew were in the White House. Mm. Uh, Kent State happened. Mm. You know, of course Woodstock happened too. Yeah. So there was a lot of a lot of stuff going on, you know, a lot of protests, card burning, all that stuff. Mm -hmm. And I decided I'd had enough of it. I wanted to go back to England. I just didn't want to be here. You know, I was like, I, I don't want to be here. I, not, I definitely don't want to join the army. Right? <laughs> so I went back to England in the early 70s, and uh, shortly after that, McLaughlin called me and said he was putting this band together in New York, and would I come and join? So. Uh, absolutely said yes to that, you know, when I heard who was playing with him. Uh, so I flew back to New York, and uh, that was the beginning of the band, you know. Mm -hmm. That was, uh, I guess, the middle of 71. Yeah. And we lasted for uh, two and a half years. Huh. Uh, and then there was another reincarnation of the orchestra with, with different members. But, uh, yeah, I noticed I was looking at some... Uh clips today and there was one later on where you didn't have Billy Cobham you had some uh, white guy who was playing the drums and yes uh, Narada I think uh -huh. his name was he was a disciple of Sweet Chin Moise oh, I see. Huh. in fact the second group I think uh, it was a larger group I think there was some violin players and yeah stuff. there was a woman on keyboards and stuff that yeah. Gail Moran who right, uh, violin, yeah. became Chick Korea's wife uh, oh. uh, but most of them were uh, Sweet Chin Moise devotees mm -hmm that group so uh, but the, it was an incredible experience with, with uh, the Mahavishnu Orchestra we we came up very fast we had a very aggressive manager he, mm -hmm. he managed uh, James Taylor and uh, Cat Stevens and some other people he was a big name lawyer of course mm -hmm. in New York and he had a lot of influence you know so but he moved us very fast I mean I couldn't you know I think within six months we were playing Carnegie Hall, mm -hmm. you know, which is, you know, a very fast uh, rise, yeah. you know. And then we were playing with, uh, you know, we were opening the show to big, you know, big rock groups. I think we played once with the Grateful Dead. We were the opening gig. <laughs> you must have been a tough act to follow. Well, actually, it was the reverse. People didn't like us much at first. Uh -huh. You know, if you're a deadhead... Yeah, then you're into this you know, mellow, kind of folksy... Yeah, kind of, yeah. And, you know, this, this music was the exact reverse of deadhead, you know. Right, right. It, it was not for, uh, you know, the, the doper crowd, you know. <laughs> <laughs> um, but uh, I was mentioning to the other night, I think, about... Uh, you asked me earlier whether I got involved with Sri Chinmoy, and I, I didn't actually get involved. I, you know, it just wasn't something I felt compelled to do. But I did get involved with uh, Swami Satchidananda, who had a, uh, a little, uh, I suppose, ashram, we call it, on the west side of New York, mm -hmm. called the Integral Yoga Center. Mm -hmm. And uh, there was a lot of people involved with him. Peter Max, the painter, oh, who right, yeah. is a champion. I think, I think Peter actually sponsored him yeah. uh, and set him up in New York. You know, I went to a Rava Shankar concert in Danbury around that time, and and he came. Swami Satchidananda came walking in with, I think it might have been Peter Max and somebody from the Young Rascals, and uh, you know, that's right. a few people like that that I recognized. <laughs> yeah, yeah, he was very popular because, of course, he 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 was at Woodstock, right? So, uh, you know, but he was a uh, he was a beautiful man. I mean, he was the embodiment of everything we talk about. You know, uh, beautiful man to be around. You know, he was uh, 
he had that that look in his eyes. You know, he was very fiery, but he was extremely he exuded peace all the time. You know, he yeah. was a very uh, beautiful man to be around. And uh, now he he initiated uh, my then wife and I into a, a different uh, mantra, uh -huh. you know, which I still remember to this day. You know, and a very beautiful ceremony, maybe about forty or fifty people in a small space in New York. And the way he did it, why he'd whisper it right in your ear. He'd bend over and he'd whisper mm -hmm. the mantra right in your ear and then touch you on the forehead and off you go. Yeah. Uh, so that was quite a uh, quite a profound experience. And then of course uh, our life had you, had you been meditating since you got that first mantra, or did you just kind of... Well, I actually had, yes. I used uh -huh. to, uh, I used to, when I was in Boston, I, I used to sit on the banks uh, uh, in Back Bay by the river. Mm -hmm. It was uh, five minutes or so from Berkeley, the school, and uh, I used to sit there and, you know, in a sort of half lotus position and uh, look at the water and mm -hmm. do my little mantra, you know. Yeah. Um, so yeah, when, you, when but, you got this new one, did you notice much difference in terms of the influence? Um, I did. I guess I did because you know it was such a direct experience from Swamiji. You know, yeah, uh, it felt more personal and mm -hmm. well, a little more uh, lofty, should I say? Yeah. yeah. The first time was there was no ceremony or no sense of specialness or, you know, it was just it was a little flat to be quite honest. Right. You know, yeah. You know. I mean, I had expected something a little more uh, colorful, shall we say. <laughs> <laughs> uh, but eventually, uh, you know, we got so crazy with my vision, we were on the road very intensely after that initi initiation with Swamiji. Things took off mm -hmm. and life became very uh, hectic, you know. We would go on the road for six weeks at a time and, uh, you know, go to Japan. And next thing you know, you're in Philadelphia, and then you're in San Francisco. You know, life wow. got very, very crazy, you yeah. know. And we were playing uh, bigger venues, you know. Instead of, you know, two or 3,000 people, now it's 10,000, 20,000, you know. Wow. It got bigger, you yeah. know. Uh, I think we did a big tour in Canada with Frank Zappa. Remember Frank Zappa? Oh, yeah. I saw the mothers in uh, Greenwich Village in about 1966 or something. Yeah. Yeah, he was a very cool guy. I liked him a lot. Yeah. He's so I, I always imagined that he would be kind of a doper and kind of a stone kind of guy. It turned yeah. out to be the exact opposite. He was very straight. I've heard that about him. Yeah, he was yeah. a very straight guy and very serious about his music, you know. Yeah. Uh, I still and, I still listen to his stuff. I have a bunch of it. Yeah, yeah. He, he was a great musician. Yeah. 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 So, uh, yeah, and, you know, uh, it ended very quickly, you know, it's one of those thing, things that, you know, uh, from the outside, you were talking about how things look to different people. Yeah. Well, you know, from the outside, people would uh, look at us in a, in a kind of a spiritual way, because it was still that kind of time, you know, there were still gurus coming to America, I can't remember some of the names, but it was still quite uh, popular, you know. Yeah. So, but there was a lot of conflict inside. Yeah. There was a lot of conflict. I think John was quite disappointed that none of us uh, signed up with Sri Chinmoy, uh -huh. you know. <laughs> uh, you know. So, there was a lot of conflict and uh, it actually caused us to uh, break up in the end, you know, sooner than we should have. But uh, that's just the story, you know. Incidentally, the, um, your little boy is making a lot of noise in the background. I'm going to it's, shut the doors. Yeah, actually, let's do parrot. that. It's my parrot. Yeah. Oh, your parrot. I thought it was a boy. Yes, I'm babysitting uh, somebody's parrot, and uh, she gets very uh, jealous. Well, that's funny. I thought it was a little kid. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. yeah. No, there's no little kids here. Uh. No. I thought, well, he's, yeah, must have married a young woman, had a kid, you know. <laughs> no, I have a daughter. She's 22. She yeah. Actually, she's, yeah, she's not here, though. Right. 
Okay, so yeah, you say you broke up because uh, McLaughlin was bent out of shape because you did, all didn't get into street training. Well, and, there were other pressures. Other reasons, I'm sure. There yeah. were lots of other reasons. You know, yeah. the thing is, we were young. You know, I was 30-something. The other guys were 20-something. You know, right. it was some heavy testosterone going around and yeah. uh, egos and, you know. Sure. Uh, not much, uh, not much enlightenment happening. <laughs> but you had a cool, you had a very enlightened name, though. Anyways, a very enlightened name, and you know, John was, John was amazing then. I mean, he was really um, on fire. You know, personally, his playing was very, uh, very on fire. You yeah. know, and uh, but there were very talented musicians, all of them. You know, mm -hmm. the fact that they weren't uh, meditators aside, you know, they were. Very talented musician. Oh, yeah. so, mm -hmm. um, so you guys broke up, and that was about seventy-five or so. Or that time? was the beginning of seventy-four. Yes, 74. and uh, then I find myself in New York, back again. I pretty much disconnected. You know, I, I, life had become weird. I got divorced and stuff, so I didn't really follow up much with Swamiji, you know, or or the meditation. Mm -hmm. Um, but you still had that yearning, I bet. I, oh, absolutely, even more than ever. Because yeah. here's, the, here's one of the things I wanted to mention here, because you know we're, we are talking about uh, awakening and non-duality and stuff. Um, you know, it's here's an example of, of samsara in action, right? Uh -huh. uh, my hero of all time, and for most, I think most serious jazz musicians, was Miles Davis. You know, right. for, me, for me, he was the be all and end all of jazz. You know, he was the guy. You uh -huh. know, that many of us modeled our life around. You know, right. And uh, there was one period with Mahavishnu. I think in '73, uh, we were playing at Avery Fisher Hall, which is kind of the epicenter of New York's classical music. You know. We were booked on a Saturday night, just us. There was no opening band or anything. It was, you know, Mahavishnu, Saturday night, Avery Fisher Hall. And uh, it was sold out, you know, because we were quite well known then. And I remember walking out on stage, you know, to this thunderous ovation. And right there in the front row was Miles Davis. Ah, cool. Well, it was cool, but here's the thing. I, I felt so not deserving of that. Huh. You know, it was like, oh my God, what am I going to do? <laughs> yeah. Yeah. You know, uh, there was that sense of fraud. I don't, I don't belong here. Uh, and he's going to know more than anyone. He's huh. going to know, you know, huh. that was kind of the, in the background of all of this, uh, what looked incredible from the front, you know, I'm I'm talking about how it looked from my perspective. Well, why did you feel that? Do you feel like it was just some personal sort of um, lack of confidence, or or was there some real sense in which you weren't deserving, or you guys were um, hypocritical, or some such thing? Well, I wasn't projecting it onto the others so much. It's uh -huh. just my own personal demons, you know. Yeah, it must I mean because you know musically. You were on a par with those other guys. I mean, you were well, you, you were as good a bass player as they were drummers and guitar players. Exactly, yeah, yeah. exactly. But, uh, so just a sense of personal inadequacy or something. Or exactly, something. but that's what I'm saying. It was that sense of uh, you know dis-ease, yeah. uh, uh, and that's just one way it manifested. There were many other ways, you know, but that was one. Well, Miles certainly had his share of disease and personal, oh, yeah. personal demons and all that. I mean, uh, he did. Yeah. He did, yeah. Um, but I just bring that up as an example of uh, the state, the kind of state, I, I suppose is the right word. You yeah. Know. Um, so after that, I was in New York, and I, things got fairly dark, you know, and, and then... Uh, I think it was 1977, I went to Europe with Stan Getz for mm -hmm. a brief, uh, I think, three or four weeks. And I came back, and I was in a very dark space. And Doing a lot of drugs, alcohol? Uh, no, I wasn't actually. I didn't drink much at all, because huh. I couldn't play when I drank. I, I learned that early on in my career. Sure, yeah. Uh, I couldn't function well. I could smoke a joint. Right. All right. Uh, but drinking, no. Yeah. I didn't like that much. But... Uh, 
Someone mentioned Chick Corea, you know, he was really happening, because he had this group called Return to Forever, mm -hmm. which was kind of a fusion group, the same as Mahavishnu, in that genre, you know. He was a keyboard player, wasn't he? He's a keyboard player, right, yes. Yeah. And he had a quartet that was kind of based on the, the same structure as we had, you know, mm -hmm. this fast, heavy, intense, loud, you know, all of those verbs, you know. Yeah. Um, and he was deeply into Scientology, huh. right? And there were several of people that I knew in New York who were musicians that said, oh, you've got to do it, man. It's, it's really the way to go, you know. So uh, that's where I went. I jumped right into it, right? I said, okay, this is, uh, this is what I need to fix my disease, you know. <laughs> <laughs> so you started holding me with tin cans and whatnot. Exactly, and... <laughs> exactly, right. right. That's right. So I got quite involved with that from 77 for about five years, mm. you know. And three of those years were very intense involvement. Uh -huh. And, uh, you know, again, it was a seeking, it was driven by seeking. It wasn't driven by anything else other than seeking, right. you know. Uh, that disease, that sort of sense of, I'm not enough, I need to be fixed, you know. Yeah. Uh, this is going to do it, you know, projecting all of that stuff. And, I, you know, I, I don't want to go too much into that, but it, it was actually a positive experience. I mean, the one-on-one -on -one with the tin cans actually was quite uh, beneficial uh -huh. in dealing with a lot of my early life stuff, you know. Speaking of the tin cans, in case somebody doesn't know, it's, it's some sort of thing like an EEG or something which measures some kind of galvanic skin response or something as exactly. you hold and you can use it to some get some sort of feedback on what your internal state is or whatever. Exactly, exactly. Yeah. But basically, it was called the E-meter. It was a very right. sophisticated device, and it was like you and I sitting here. You would be the auditor, and I would be the auditee. Right. And you'd be watching the meter, and I'd be holding the can. So I didn't really know what response was happening, right? So you would ask me a question. And I didn't actually need to answer it at all. The uh -huh. meter give a response. Yeah. And I could actually say something or not. And the auditor would note the response and we would proceed from there, you see. Huh. Basically, the, the thing was reading basically the amount of charge, the amount of right. negative charge on an issue, you know. Uh, and when the when the issue was handled properly, there would be no more reaction. I see. You see, so when you when you took the charge off the issue, you would be uh, the needle would stop moving, right? So I went forward with that. Now, you know, to say that that was a, a spiritual experience, yes, I suppose it was. Uh, and I, in, in hindsight, I would say. There were many times when I was, I don't want to use the word awaken, it's a kind of a strong uh -huh. word, but in hindsight, not at the time, uh, what I understand now to be that uh, condition was there. Yeah. It was absolutely there. Sure. You know? um, no question about it. There were days that I felt completely like that. It was like, wow, you know. Yep. Uh, uh, but there was never any talk of those words. I, I don't recall ever hearing the word enlightenment or awakened or self-realization or consciousness or any of those terms ever used. Right. And nor was the word God ever used. Yeah. Just wasn't in there. It just wasn't there. No, Ron you. Hubbard, Ron L. Hubbard was L. Ron, it. yeah. That was it. Incidentally, I once heard Maharishi Mahesh Yogi say that if L. Ron Hubbard had been in charge of the TM movement, it would have achieved its goals a lot sooner, or, or you know, in much less time than he felt he was achieving them. Um, he, he had, he, for some reason, he had a lot of respect for the man. Well, he was an yeah, he was an amazing organizer, and uh, yeah, I mean, yeah. definitely, <laughs> probably, probably, a fully awakened person, a non-person, however you want to say it. Yeah. You know. So, uh, and they didn't, I guess I left, I left there in 1982, and you know, they don't have things like, okay, you don't need any more because you're awakened now, right? right? There were levels. There's no know. end to how much money you can spend and how many things you can there do. There you go. Yeah. <laughs> Basically go on forever. Right. 
and uh, some people do. I think Chick Corea has been involved ever since, you know. Still doing it? Yes, as far as I know. Yeah, him and Travolta and Tom Cruise. Exactly. and That's they, right. They can afford it. They can afford it, exactly. <laughs> yeah. uh, but I kind of ran out of money. That was one reason. Yeah. And, uh, and basically, you know, I, I kind of got that, you know, this business of progressive you know, levels, you know, there's, there's more to achieve, you know. I didn't really understand why, but I kind of knew that that wasn't it. I mm. kind of knew, no, I, I don't need more. I don't need more, you know. Yeah. Although, uh, you know, I'm going to interject here. I'm getting ahead of our story a little bit, but just this morning I was listening to Gangaji being interviewed by uh, a guy named Stephen Dynan, and he said, you know, well, ever since your awakening, which must have been 20 years ago or something now, um, how do you feel like there has been further progress? And she said, oh, yes, you know, there's just, there's continual deepening, continual unfoldment, you know, and there's so, there's always so much to work out on the relative levels in terms of your relationships and, you know, your personality quirks and all that kind of stuff. So I thought, you know, that was an interesting answer. Uh, I don't mean to dispute what you just said, but, you know, since I know you have respect for Gangaji, I thought I'd mm -hmm. throw that in the mix here to... <laughs> Yeah, I mean, just in the context of that uh, particular uh, aspect, you know, Scientology, just personally, I'm not yeah. making a statement about the organization or anything. It was just a personal thing. I, I, I just felt like it's time to move on. Right, absolutely, sure. And also, I was transitioning. I, You know, I had another passion, which is photographer, which started when I was a kid, and I kind of dropped it for many years. Mm -hmm. Uh, when I was on the road with Mahavishnu in Tokyo, uh, I bought myself some serious cameras and uh, sort of rekindled that uh, passion, you know. So in 1981, uh, I kind of built up a little business as a hobby, actually, when I was still playing. Yeah. Uh, and I was beginning to do better and better. <clears throat> And I really enjoyed, what I really enjoyed was the, you know, the uh, independence. You know, as right. a bass player for hire, it's not a lot of fun, i got to mm -hmm. tell you. You know, yeah. with a group like Mahavishnu or Stan Getz or something, that's wonderful, you know. But when you're in New York and you're just uh, another guy on a list of, you know, 50 guys yeah. looking for work on a, on a weekend, it's, it's, uh, it's not that much fun, you yeah. know, for most people. I'm not, I'm sure people have... Plus, there's a lot, if you're if you're in a successful group, there's a lot of traveling and all the rigor. Yeah, all the glamour life. goes with it. You know, yeah. like, uh, staying in beautiful hotels and you have limousines and yeah. backstage passes and 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 lots of uh, you know nice looking women hanging around backstage. You know, <laughs> uh, you know all that stuff. Um, so you know, I, I kind of like the independence. You know, just being able to negotiate my own terms with yeah. clients. And, uh, what kind of photography were you doing? Well, I was doing two things. I was doing what's called stock photography, where you create images uh, for a library of images. And sure. They, they yeah. mark them worldwide on your behalf. Uh huh. And they kind of guide you in terms of subject matter, you know. What they need. What they need. So you're not really an employee. You still kind of do your own thing. Uh huh. And, uh, you know, you, you, uh, you pay your own fees and expenses and everything. And they do the marketing, and we would split it 50-50. So that's called stock photography, which I'm still involved with today. Yeah, like Comstock and those different... Exactly, right. exactly. Um, yeah. I'm with Getty Images, actually. Sure. Uh -huh. That's uh, a pretty big agency. Yeah. And the other side was I was doing uh, portraits for jazz musicians, you know, record covers at the time, and eventually mm -hmm. CD covers. Uh -huh. I'm doing one in September for a guy called Steve Kahn in New York. Hmm. So I did quite a bit of that. And uh, I found a little niche market. My first, my uh, my wife at the time uh, that I just got married in '81, '82, actually '85. I met her in '82. Was a lawyer in New York, and uh, she worked at one of these enormous firms. You know, where they had I think three or four hundred lawyers. And uh, I found out they needed uh, pictures. They needed a, a directory of all their people, so they hired me to do the headshots. Mm. And that opened a niche market that I never even knew existed, you know. And eventually I uh, had many, many clients in New York like that. Hmm. For You know, I still have a few like that. Uh, and so I did hundreds of... Sh I shot lawyers. That's what I... <laughs> <laughs> 
I shot hundreds of lawyers. I'm yeah. proud to say, yeah. So uh, that's that's kind of what I did, and then uh, so I'd like to get up to the point where Gangaji enters the picture, but there's yeah. so such as you know, there's a lot of story in between. You mentioned AA at one point, but uh, yes. I haven't okay. really heard so about any drinking. <laughs> not, not that we have to, you know, wallow in that, but... You well, know. no, but I can fast forward through it. Uh, mm. I started drinking the day I met my wife. <laughs> <laughs> Sounds like a Catskills uh, comedian <laughs> joke or something. <laughs> Rodney Dangerfield. <laughs> well, it was like a Rodney Dangerfield. He had this joke. He said, uh, my wife and I were happy for 25 years, and then we met. <laughs> 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 and I'm sure you could twist a lawyer joke or two in there too. <laughs> yeah, yeah. So um, I hope my wife doesn't hear this video, but I'm sure she will, won't mind me mentioning that. Yeah, but he didn't mention her it's name. Just, just coincidence, you know. Uh, it just kind of progressed like that. I mean, life, my life was going well. You know, I was earning more and more, and we had a nice place to live on the west side of New York. And, uh, you know, I started drinking, you know, in the evening, and uh, it kind of progressed, you know. Hmm. And after about five years, I was drinking a lot. Wow. You know? Now, I wasn't doing any drugs anymore. I stopped smoking before yeah. Scientology. That was one of the requirements, actually. You can't do it unless you're straight. You know? Did you still have any kind of spiritual motivation going on? In the Not at all. Not at all. kind of Everything got wiped just, out. The whole thing was just gone. I was a married guy with a business, you hmm. know, making a lot of money. Uh, enjoying my life tremendously, you know, I was really busy, I was working six days a week, you yeah. know, and uh, drinking, that was my, uh, that was my uh, spiritual your, seeking, was your, in a bottle. Your, your yeah. relief valve, yeah. Right, that was my seeking, because again, it's all seeking. Huh. You, know, you, you basically drink because you're, you, you're, you have this expectancy of, uh, you know, a better condition, you know, I'm not going to feel as stressed out. Yeah. In other words, you don't like the state of consciousness you're in, you want to change it. So exactly. you take That's something right. to change it. Exactly. Yeah. That's, right. That's right. So it was basically, you know, like that. And then I guess by 1993, I, I kind of realized, I used to keep a journal. I started keeping a journal in my photo studio. And, you know, the entries were, did it again last night, you know, drank the whole bottle. I said I wouldn't, and I did, you know. Wow. And this went on and on and on. And then one day I was photographing a jazz musician, a woman, uh, Sheila Jordan, for a record cover, and she she said, "You look a little rough." And I said, "Yeah, I'm I'm hungover, you know." Yeah. And she said, "Oh, I used to drink too, you know." And she kind of softly introduced me to the concept of AA, which I, you know, I had no real ideas about other than what most people probably think a lot of you know drunken bums. <laughs> I, I know enough about it to, to realize that it has a real spiritual dimension to it. It does, it does. Yeah. So uh, one day I just decided that was it. I'd had enough, it was time to stop. I went to a meeting in New York and I was very surprised. It was in Midtown and it was full of uh, very nice looking people with suits and ties. They were actually lawyers and business people, you know. And I was very pleasantly surprised. And from that day on, I never had another drink. That's that great. was it. Huh. Do you still have a, yeah, did you still have cravings for them, or did it no, just kind of disappear? Just went away. That's great. I, mean, I went to meetings a lot. I, from that point forward, I went to meetings uh, pretty much every day. Yeah. Because I know that alcoholics always have this thing about, or the AA people at least always have this thing of, you know, you're always going to be an alcoholic all your life, you know? And that always seemed a little bleak to me. Uh, yeah, it is a little bleak. I mean, I have 17 years in about two weeks, next week, actually. Yeah. And, you know, it, I don't go to meetings anymore. I haven't for quite a while. But I've never had that urge. You know, I'm yeah. cool with it. I'm around people who drink at dinner time, and it's nothing happens. You know, it's just it's yeah. not a problem, you know. Mm -hmm. Plus, I do a lot of work, you know, like spiritual work, I suppose, is the right word. Yeah, well, that actually gets us into the next chapter of your life, I think. I mean, you did the AA thing, but, um, you know, then what? I mean, let's, let's yeah, go on. Okay, so, uh, you know, eventually um, I got divorced. Things got, you know, when you get sober, things, you look at things, like, a little more clearly. And <laughs> eventually I got divorced, and I moved out of New York in uh, 2003 to where I live now. It's about an hour out of the city. 
And uh, I'd started, actually started spiritual reading again after I got divorced. I kind of felt like, okay, and, and I think through AA too, you know. Um, again, AA, you know, I, I don't want to get into a critical diatribe about it, but, you know, the the whole thing there is the 12 steps, you know, that if, if you do the 12 steps and so forth, your life will be uh, better and improved and everything like that. Well, I did the 12 steps and I didn't really feel any better. Uh -huh. <clears throat> you know, and I wasn't drinking and I didn't feel like I needed to. But that, that same dis-ease, that same I'm not enough, it's not enough, you know, was still there. Yeah. Was still there, you know. And so I started reading and I guess uh, I stumbled upon Osho at some point. Mm -hmm. uh, I was with a lady friend and we both discovered Osho and I absolutely loved Osho, yeah. you know. I mean, what a beautiful man and his unique way of speaking. I don't know if people on your site have heard him on YouTube or anything, but he's a very unique speaker, you know. And uh, he had a he had a place in New York. Incidentally, Osho was also no, known by the name Rajneesh, in case Rajneesh. anybody, yeah, Bhagavan that's, Rajneesh. That's right, and he right. had that center in Oregon. Right, the notorious that, situation. The notorious, exactly. Gun-toting Sheila and all that business. There you go. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> But him, you know, he was a beautiful guy, and you know, I recommend people check him out on on YouTube. Mm. His speaking, um, and he had a place in New York where he could go. Uh, I think seven o'clock every evening they would play a video of Osho, mm -hmm. and do some of that uh, dancing that the Osho people do. It's kind of a meditation dance thing they do, you right. know. So we did that for a while, and then you know we kind of stumbled upon uh, other people. And again, I started rereading re Krishnamurti a bit. Mm -hmm. uh, I got him a little more at this stage. You know, I think, you know, as, as your suffering deepens, you know, your personal suffering, you know, you, you, uh, you understand a little more. You know, you begin to see. Oh, that's what they mean. You know, yeah. you know. and then fast forwarding a bit to two thousand and one. I started going to a, a Buddhist meeting right near my house, it was five minutes away, in August of 2001. And the next week, or two weeks, was when 9-11 happened. Ah. I, and it was just coincidental that I happened to be going to this meeting, this Buddhist meeting. It was a small meeting uh, led by a guy named Kadam Morton, uh, you know, an American guy under the tutelage of Geshe Kelsang Gyatso, who's a Tibetan monk who lives in America. <clears throat> and uh, I loved it. I mean, it was, I, I felt very um, comfortable there, you know. Um, you know, it, it just seemed to make more sense to me than pretty much anything else I'd looked into. I'm not going to say I was a believer or anything, or, or I was zealotic about it. At that time in my life, it just, it was a good place to be, and uh, you know, but 9/11 happened in New York, and that was a very profound time. Very profound. I mean, apart from the obvious dreadful tragedy, there was an it was an amazing time to be in the city. <clears throat> there was a sense of oneness about everything. Huh. You know, I would write. Not only that you felt, but that many people were feeling. You mean? I think many people were had dropped their personal facade, you know, and everyone just got in, kind of into this sort of uh, oneness feeling. Everyone was on the same page for a while. Huh. You know? <clears throat> like there was a sort of a brotherhood, you mean, yes. among everyone? Yes. Yeah, I mean, yeah. I, I remember riding down on my bike on the West Side Highway to the site and coming across people sitting on a bench crying, you know, you'd stop and you'd sit down and say, oh, I had a friend, you know. Yeah. And you just talk, you know. You didn't need to know their name or who they were, you know, you just talk about it, you know. Um, so that was uh, that was when I began. And I went there for, I guess, about two years until I moved out of the city out here. And uh, 
sort of dropped that at that point because I didn't want to, you know, it was difficult for me to travel into the city <clears throat> quite a week. And uh, I guess I, as far as Gangaji, I was, something happened two and a half years ago which had a very profound effect on me. I wouldn't say it, it wasn't necessarily a positive effect. I came home from the gym one day. I go to the gym quite a lot. And I sat down on my computer uh, to do some work. And there was this searing pain around my tailbone, huh. like I sat down on a broken glass. Wow. I thought, wow, what's that? I must have pulled something at the gym or stretched something or did something. Well, that began uh, an issue which is still ongoing. And, uh, you know, I began, uh, began a whole medical uh, search for a fix that never happened, right? Did you figure out what it was? Well, there's a name for it. It's called coccidinia, which is tailbone pain. But the uh, coccyx is, is um, traumatized in some way or something? Yes, yeah. traumatized. And uh, it, it's triggered by sitting, unfortunately. So <laughs> you can imagine if you're a meditator. Yeah. That would cause you. Imagine if you couldn't actually sit down. How would you meditate? Right. Would you have to do it lying down or something? Lying down or something. You standing, whatever. Yeah. So it was a very distressing thing because uh, it it was chronic pain, hmm. and you know, chronic pain after which is after three months. You know, you were talking the other night. I was listening to you talking with uh, James Swartz. I think it was. Uh -huh. Yeah. And you mentioned hitting your thumb with a hammer. Right. So he was talking about the body, you know. Yeah. Uh, and your response was, well, it would really hurt if you whacked your thumb. You know, you definitely feel it, you know. Yeah. You couldn't uh, just, uh, you know, think your way out of it, you know. Um, and, you know, the most distressing thing about it was, I mean, it's not like that so much now, but in the first period was it, it, it draws your attention to the body. Yeah. Chronic pain, you know, <clears throat> it's, it's such a challenging condition. Which know. is probably the purpose of it, uh, you know? Exactly. I mean, your body is saying, I need attention. Yes. <laughs> right. You need to fix this. Yeah. It's like driving in a car with something, you know, the red light flashing on your dashboard. You right. Know? You need to you do need something. To and of course, I've done everything that you can possibly think to do. I've run out of medical procedures. There's none left. You, huh. know. you might want to check out the guy I interviewed last week, Gary Crowley. He sounds like he's kind of a miracle worker with people who've, you know, hit a dead end with everybody else. Oh, really? Yeah, I'll, check out I'll his have, interview. Yeah, I'll have his book. I have yeah. his, uh, that book, the first book he wrote. Mm hmm. I'll definitely follow up on that. Yeah. Um, so anyway, uh, after about six months of this, you know, of, of trying to manage it and everything, and kind of getting disgusted with doctors who didn't seem to have a clue, um, I picked up this book called uh, "The Diamond in Your Pocket" ah. uh, by Gangaji, uh -huh. and started reading it. And uh, I'm, not, I'm not going to claim that there was a sudden awakening or suddenly I was there. Yeah. I mean, I think it happened gradually. Mm -hmm. I also think it had been happening for years and years in many different ways. And I, had, of course, had no way to say, to, to identify what was happening or understand it. But uh, something about the way she was describing um, what it is just suddenly it was there. I said, uh -huh. Oh, that's it? <laughs> this yeah. kid, are you kidding me? Yeah. <laughs> After all this, mm -hmm. you know, it was it was shocking. That's you know. what they all say. It was shocking. You know, was, almost everybody says that. It's like, oh, no this way. has been here all along, you know. This is it? Wow. Gla glasses on the head syndrome. Yeah. It's 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 really out there, you know, it's mm -hmm. really out there because it's 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 kind of a nasty cosmic trick. You know? <laughs> No. Yeah. Well, I mean, it's in logically speaking. I mean, if if we're talking about realizing reality, how can reality not have been here? You know, where is it going to go? Hide in the corner someplace? I mean, exactly. it's, it's kind of like an omnipresent thing. It's reality. 
you know, and so uh, obviously we must be immersed in it and living it in some way. It's just a matter of the recognition. Exactly, and it, you know, I, I can't even pinpoint what page or what sentence it was, but yeah. you know, the, her whole book is kind of like that, you know, uh -huh. and that kind of opened the floodgates, you know, uh, for the next year or so. I devoured books by everybody, you know. I was always aware of Eckhart Tolle, you know. Yeah. Um, I mean, his his language is not as uh, related to. Uh, Ramana Maharshi say as as Gangaji is mm -hmm. you know via via Papaji doesn't right? have that limit lineage right right but you know Eckhart is uh, it's the same message essentially mm -hmm. you know so uh, that's interesting and on the one hand it's all, it's kind of paradoxical because on the one hand you you sort of found what you were looking for and there was a, an end to the seeking. And on the other hand, the, that end to the seeking precipitated a huge book friend, yeah, yeah. book reading. Yeah, uh, I wanted to hear what other people had to say about it. You know, yeah. how many ways are there to talk about nothing? You know. Yeah, that, that's kind of where I'm at. I mean, and in fact, that's how you kind of found me. I guess you somehow connected. You were listening to Richard Miller's things, I guess, and then exactly. you heard me on that, and so you came here, and now you've listened to most of these. And uh, you know, and I, I don't. I don't get the sense that you're sort of looking for some little gem of information that's going to kind of do it for you, but it's just interesting to hear everybody's different way of expressing fundamentally the same thing. Absolutely. And Absolutely. It, and I, I, personally, I also like being able to express it better. So the more people I listen to, the the more I can kind of articulate it. Exactly, exactly. Because, you know, in essence, I think James Swartz was saying this in one of your interviews, that, you know, all we have is language, you know. If people are going to understand this, well, uh, I don't know if that's the right word, but, you know, it's through words. It's yeah. not through anything else. It's through the words that you're going, you know, Ramana Maharshi said, who, who am I? You know, right. those, those words as inquiry. <clears throat> um, so I love the, you know, and the thing is in, in uh, the... The hardcore uh, non-duality world, you know, stories have a bad rap. You right. know, you know, we don't really care about your story. Yeah. You know, uh, who, who there's nobody there to have a story anyway. You right. know. But that's nonsense. You know what I mean? Human beings love stories. We love stories. Well, the fact is, I mean, you just said it. We're human beings. Um, yeah. We're not just, you know. We're not just sort of abstract vacuum state nothingness. Yeah, uh, you, know. you know, on some level we are that, but uh, uh, but you can't get away from the fact that you are also a human being, and that's why I sometimes bring in my little morbid, you know, hit your thumb with a hammer, you know, point because it's mm -hmm. like, you know, and in fact I, I heard Adyashanti say one time that that's why the Zen masters used a stick. If somebody got too much into the notion of oh I'm nobody, there's nothing, they <laughs> whack them with a stick. Uh, exactly. uh, you know, who felt that, you know? That's right. <laughs> <laughs> that's, that's right. Yeah, there, there is there is a you know a tendency in in the hardcore non-duality people to uh, kind of dehumanize things a little bit. I think you know because life goes on. Life goes yeah. on. I mean, you've you've had some great speakers on your site, by the way. I think it's a you know it's a great site, and uh, you're really making a nice uh, contribution there. Oh, it's a lot of fun. Yeah, it's going to be. It's a great resource, you know, because you can, you know, you live in this place. It just sounds like uh, Shangri-La, you know. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yes and no. I mean, definitely has its problems, and and I'm not even part of the organization anymore that is predominating here, the TM organization. But it's a nice sort of eclectic spiritual community, and and there are of course many wonderful people in the TM organization. Uh, not knocking it. Uh, but outside of that, there's also this sort of diverse spiritual community, and everyone's been here. Gangaji has been here. Adyashanti is coming. Amachi comes every year. You know, uh, um, Mother Mira has been here. Uh, Karuna Mai. I mean, just all these different teachers and saints, and all. It's it's a it's a kind of a stopping point on the spiritual circuit, and um, you know there are people like yourself who. You know, I mean, there's some people who are kind of hardcore, hardland. They won't see anything else, do anything else, and if that works for them, fine. But there are others who just sort of like to uh, take a hybrid approach and uh, get the blessings wherever they may come from. Yeah, no, it's it's, it's very true. You know, and uh, there's so many ways of expressing. You know, 
even though we're talking about something which obviously can't be really expressed because it's you know it's it's just not expressible in, in words. But nonetheless, uh, it's I think it's wonderful to read Ajashanti, for example. I love his books. You know. Mm -hmm. um, do you know who John Wheeler is? Do you read He's his? a physicist, isn't he? Or there's another guy named John Wheeler. Uh, no, John Wheeler uh, has, I think, four or five books out huh. on, on the subject of non-duality. Huh. Uh, he was. Uh, is he still alive? Yes, he is. Yeah. Oh, maybe He's, I should interview him. Yeah, he'd be a he'd be a great guy to interview. Yeah, I'll uh, put him he down. Li he lives in. Uh, he has a website. I can't remember it offhand, but it's quite easy to find. Um, He's in his 40s, I guess, and he uh, he was a seeker, a suffering seeker, you know, mm -hmm. as all seekers actually are, right? Right. If you're still seeking, you're suffering. Right. right. So he went to see uh, Sailor Bob, uh, Bob Adamson in Australia. He took a trip. I think uh, John Wheeler lives in uh, either San Jose or somewhere like that in the West. Actually, I may have heard him when I listened to Urban Guru Cafe. I yes, think he's, yes. He's, yeah, because I listened to all those, so he's probably yes. on there. Yeah. He's out there, yes. I think he did three or four interviews there. Yeah. Uh, so he, he actually went to directly meet Sailor Bob Addison, who was, a, I guess, a, had studied with Nisargadatta. Nisargadatta, yeah. yeah. So, and, and John Wheeler's books, I mean, he's very, very hardcore. I mean, he just keeps hammering, you know, there's no one there, you know. There, uh -huh. He's very anti-story, you know. Yeah. But that's just his particular approach. Yeah, you know, you know I, I'm actually, I, I feel a little trepidation about interviewing anyone who's that hardcore in the in the um, the new Advaita scene because I feel like it's not the whole story, but I don't feel really qualified to argue the the uh, you know the opposite perspective. I mean, somebody mm -hmm. like Timothy Conway, who I interviewed a few weeks ago, is much better equipped, and he he can quote you know all these different you know. Saints and like uh, Ramana Maharshi and the Sargadatta himself to to counter you know to contradict someone who says that you know that's the whole emphasis. But I feel a little unqualified. <laughs> yeah, well, you know, you you've got some wonderful people there. I've listened to most of those people, and you know, some of them are so uh, well educated on the subject. You know, yeah, James Forrest was amazing. I mean, he. You know the the way he talks and yeah. he's so knowledgeable about things and having lived in India for thirty years, you know. And you know what I find actually in interviewing these people, uh, like James and uh, you know Chuck Hillig, uh, mm -hmm. and um, you know uh, some of the others, is that they're just real down to earth guys. You know, I mean they're, just, they're just chummy, friendly, unpretentious, easygoing, <laughs> yeah, good, good sense of humor. You know, not putting on airs of any kind. And uh, that, that to me is uh, one of the criterion of genuine spiritual development, you know? Yeah, well, I was going to ask you about that. You know, like, it's one of those paradoxes, I guess. How do you qualify when someone claims to be awakened? You know, how. Well, is, you mean in order to know whether I want to interview them or not? Well, or, just in general. How, in general, how would you? In general. I mean, uh, someone can come along and say, well, you know, uh, I had this uh, awakening, such and such, or I'm, I, you know, I'm fully enlightened. I can't imagine anyone saying they're fully enlightened. That just doesn't work at all, you know. But yeah, well, uh, the way I do it is that I, uh, first of all, I don't claim to know, to be able to know, uh, you know, because how can I judge? You know, I'm not a guru, I'm not a master, and even they, I wonder sometimes, may or may not know. But um, I. Take, I tend to take. I give people the benefit of the doubt. I take them at their word. Uh, but on the other hand, if there's a strong aroma of ego, of you know self-aggrandizement or something like that, I'm, I'm wary. Mm -hmm. um, I also have the notion that there are many degrees of awakening, and that you know one can. It's sort of like the Russian dolls, where you open them up yes. and there's another one inside and another one inside, and uh, you know many stages, many degrees. Um, which, you know, there is this sort of a, uh, opposition in some circles to the progressive nature of spiritual development, but I've really never seen an exception to it. Um, you know, I mean, maybe, I mean, even if there is some element which is always the same, like you said earlier, 
you know, you realized when you had that awakening reading the Gangaji book that this thing had been there all along. Um, and yes, that's true. So there is something that never changes. But on the other hand, our ability to reflect that, the clarity with which we can experience it, the, the degree to which we can express it, all those things have, as far as I can tell, infinite room for improvement or for growth. And uh, so if someone says they've had, they're awake or something, I say, great. Uh, but I, I expect they will, most of them acknowledge, and if they don't acknowledge, I expect they will eventually find that there is yet more to unfold. So that's my perspective. I, it's, mm -hmm. I, may, I may change it. You know, two years from now, I might be talking differently, but that's the way I see it. Yeah, I, I agree with that. And I, you know, I think it's more a function of just being. I don't think there's anything to do. I don't think there's really anything you can do. But I think it just evolves on its own, the same as it always has. You know, it just, like you said, it's like a Russian doll. You know, suddenly there's a deeper level. Yeah. See, it goes a little deeper. And, you know... Uh, but, but, you know, but to, just to counter, can, can counter that, I mean... That to which you give your attention grows stronger in your life. I mean, for decades you have been putting your attention on spiritual things, even though you've also been putting your attention on some other things. But you know, you've been reading books, and you've been, you know. And as someone said, uh, you know, spiritual awakening may be an accident, but spiritual practices make you accident prone. Uh -huh. and, and I do think there's. Uh, I, I'm not of the of the persuasion that. Um, all meditation and other spiritual practices are a lot of bunk. I think that they culture the nervous system, they refine the the mind and whatever, and just make you more and more um, likely to have the kind of awakening we're talking about. You know, I mean, if you were to just if you take two people, one of them meditates regularly, the other knocks back a you know pint of gin every day for for 20 years. Which one do you think is more likely to have a spiritual awakening? Exactly. You know, not that the gin guy couldn't have it is anything's possible but what's what's more probable mm -hmm. <laughs> That's right well it, it really is a mystery you know uh, it's such a mystery and you know I think I sent you an email recently about why it is that uh, you know this seems to be so difficult for your average you know Joe Plummer type person you know uh, you know, Tony Parsons talks about that, and, you know, I listen to him, and he talks about his meetings where some people just get up and leave, you know. Right. They hear him talking because it just seems like such nonsense, you know. Yeah. Um, a friend of mine gave Eckhart Tolle, Tolle's book, A New Earth, to a friend of hers who's a very educated woman, an English teacher, and she said she read a chapter and she thought it was complete nonsense. Yeah. You know? Well, you know, as Sly and the Family Stone said, different strokes for different folks. And yeah. uh, it's, uh, I think there has to be a certain receptivity before you can get it. I mean, Christ used to say, uh, you know, cast you not your pearls before swine. Um, and obviously, you know, he, some people totally got what he was. Mm -hmm. Other people wanted to kill him and did. Uh, right. So, you know, and, and, and as he said, as he was being crucified, forgive them, Father, they know not what they do. So I, I right. think it all depends on one's ability to perceive and recognize. And there, and what we're talking about is actually extremely subtle. You know, it's very subtle. It's very subtle. It's, it's so subtle we can't express it in words, and yet we know what we're talking about. And, uh, you know, most people are not accustomed to perceiving subtle things. They're constantly bombarded with gross stimuli. And you get habituated to that, and unless you somehow you know find a way to uh, break that habituation and turn your attention to the subtle, you know you're not going to know it's there. Well, you know our society in general is so bombarded with messages which are the exact opposite of this. Yeah. You know, all about a person, all about you know uh, buy this drug, buy this. Uh, Car, right. Know. I mean, every single commercial, not 75% of the commercials on TV, or see your, ask your doctor if such and such is right for you. I mean, I never, I, I've been to a doctor maybe twice in my life. I wouldn't need to. <laughs> you know. I mean, we're the entire thing, the political system, the medical system, everything, the the the, the media, it's all, uh, it's all about person. 
you know, about you, the person, you know. Yeah. Uh, and then you get the religious extremists, you know, who go the other way, and you know, it, it's no wonder so many people are have a hard time, even even getting a hint of what we're talking about here. You know. Yeah, but as Dylan said, you know, something's going on here, but you don't know what it is. There's <laughs> there's definitely something afoot. And, and as you listen to the kind of stuff that we've been talking about, and there's so many cool things you can listen to these days. For instance, these, okay. right now I'm listening to something called the Sacred Awakening series, and I have a, a link to that on, on batgap.com, where it's 40 different interviews. Gangaji was one of them. Julia Butterfly Hill was another I just listened to, and all these different people. And, you know, there's so many brilliant, wonderful people that are saying over and over again that, there's really a major shift taking place in the world mm -hmm. and uh, it may not be evident on the surface level of things and and you know and and you wonder when you see all these disasters and everything taking place you think how can something good be happening but that very well may be part of it because you know the old ways are crumbling and uh, you know the consequences of the wrong way of doing things are becoming more and more obvious um, so I find it I'm not at all discouraged or, uh, you know, pessimistic, uh, even though I, you know, who knows how much hell may break loose before things have really shifted and settled out. I really do feel that something wonderful is taking place, and mm -hmm. it's, it's, it's nice to, be, to feel at least that one is part of that and contributing in some small way. It is, and I think that's kind of why I emailed you a while back, because I just felt like, well, I'm not qualified to say anything. I mean, who am I? But on the other hand, you know, you, you do feel that urge to kind of share, you know what I mean? Yeah, we, we all do what we can do in our own way. I mean, I listen to guys like Adya Shanti and I think, boy, I'd love to be able to do that, but boy, I, I sure am a long way from being able to. I mean, I could never get up in front of an audience and talk the way he talks. But, you know, yeah. I'm doing this, you know, this is my contribution, you know, well, some, no, something I can do. It's, it's all good, you know, and I think one of the most amazing things in the past couple of years was Eckhart Tolle on Oprah Winfrey. Yeah. You know, where he did a series, I think, for six weeks. Yeah, I watched that whole thing. Yeah, I did too. Uh, yeah, I, that was great. And, you know, millions of people watched that, you mm -hmm. know, all over the world. I actually sent a little uh, tape in to Oprah because she recently had a thing where she was trying to recruit somebody to be on her new network, and I sent a tape in proposing that we do something like this, you know, uh -huh. uh, and uh, you know, got kind of lost in the shuffle of uh, ten thousand other tapes, but <laughs> or <laughs> videos. But uh, anyway, I gave it a shot. Yeah, no, that's uh, that could be that could be a great thing. Yeah. yeah. So uh, yeah, I mean it. Um, so how do you feel these days? I mean, you had this awakening in, you know, some few years ago with reading the Gangaji book, and it, it sort of rekindled your interest in, in spiritual things, and you started to read things all the time. I mean, do you feel like kind of a pervading sense of contentment or inner happiness or anything like that? Do you, do you get depressed still and, and feel like you've kind of lost that, that um, sense of awakening, or is it pretty consistent regardless of the ups and downs of life? I would say it's much more consistent, and the you know the initial burst when I started reading you know if you saw my bookshelf now there's probably forty books on non duality I probably read yeah. everything out there at at some point, I just stopped doing that you know uh -huh. I, the books I said I don't need to know any more I mean but you're still listening to stuff like my thing. Oh, yeah, I love listening to stuff. And yeah. in fact, I'm going back to some books and finding, you know what? I didn't read this the first time. Mm. I missed half of it. You know, yeah. I don't know why, but I because you know it's such powerful stuff. You can almost read the same book over and over again. Yeah. You know, uh, and and get a completely different perspective. You know. Very true. Yeah, a lot of uh, these things. Yeah, because it's always fresh, you know. Mm -hmm. And fresh. because, you know, you're you're approaching it from a new level of consciousness because you're evolving. And so, you know, uh, you know, you read something a few years later and it's like you're, you're at a whole different level of awareness, level of consciousness. That's right. So that's right. And it's not because I did anything. You see what I mean? That's the point here. It's not that I personally did anything about that. It's just... It evolves. There's it, a momentum going now, yeah. Yes. Yeah. Uh, another thing I noticed after the initial confusion, it was quite confusing. It mm -hmm. was like, you know, uh, another thing I've noticed that is I don't engage with thoughts nearly as much as I used to. They don't grip you anymore. They don't 
take me away. Right. You know, it's like, you know, I used to be, you know, one of the things that used to, people used to describe me when I was younger as a musician was, oh, that, that Rick, he's preoccupied. Huh. You know. You were sort of obsessive? I was obsessive and I was lost in thought. I was lost in thought. I was, it was all like me, 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 my, 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 mine, me, my. <laughs> You know, yeah. it was like a loop that just went round and round and round. You know, it's yeah. like samsara. Samsara just uh -huh. goes round and round and round. And now you've kind of broken free of that. Well, I wouldn't say totally, but, you know, I have my days when I feel like a, a sufferer, you know. Yeah. Uh, do you think it, any of this has to do with merely having matured, or do you think it's more of a spiritual thing and, you know, you can sort of think of peers who have grown older as you've grown older but who haven't gained this kind of inner freedom yeah I, I, you know Gangaji talks about it as uh, you know like a blessing like a state like a grace you know you, it's just kind of a lucky fluke you mm -hmm. know but I'm not sure about that because I think as I've as I said through the interview you know you know there was this dis-ease all yeah. through my life this sense of it's not right. Something's not right. right, you know. Seek and you shall find. Knock and exactly. the door, door, exactly. door yeah. shall be opened. Just, you know, and even though, you know, you get off track, there's nothing that's not seeking yeah. when, you, when you look at it. There's not drinking, drugs, sexing, you know, all of that is seeking. Because Someone said recently uh, that, you know, we're all on a spiritual path. And that, all, that meant all seven billion of us, you know. That's, we're, we're, that's, true. that's true. Some people it's more explicit. But it's we're all basically carried along by the same uh, force, you know. Exactly, that's right. Being is all powerful, you know, and and it's full of wonder and surprise, and it evolves constantly, you know. Yeah. Um, and there's nothing you can do about it. I mean, you, you like you said, you can meditate. Absolutely. I mean, you. I mean. Uh, one of the things I do, I don't necessarily meditate because the sitting, of course, is a little. Yeah. But I do. I, I don't know if I'd call it a practice, but I do at least an hour of hatha yoga every day. Oh, that's great. It's probably good for your uh, back problem too. It's good for everything. Yeah. Uh, I do it at the gym, you uh -huh. know, and there's a very nice little quiet space where you can put a mat out and you know you don't yeah. have to listen to bombastic music. <laughs> right. And it's very quiet and. Uh, you know, I have a little routine of movements, and it, it really, I suppose it is a meditation because I'm always in a, in a nice state when I stop. It's always yeah. like, oh, that's, you know, uh, there's more of a sense of present, being mm -hmm. present, and less distracted, and, you know. Well, Hatha you know, Yoga is, a, you know, m many yogis have gotten enlightened just through Hatha Yoga. It's considered to be a very legitimate traditional path, you know. Yeah, you know, of course, if someone watched me doing it, they say, well, <laughs> you know, I get a long way to go. <laughs> yeah. well, you, know, I, I, you know, my body's, this this body is almost 70 time years old, so right. it's not as flexible as it was. You know. yeah. But, uh, you know, it, it's a great thing. I really uh, recommend it for anybody, for, for any, sure. you know, for any It's a great thing. Yeah. Good. So, how are we doing? I haven't even looked at the clock. Oh, we're, we're coming along. So, um, do you feel like there's anything? I always ask this question towards the end of interviews, but do you feel like there's anything that you were kind of thinking we would talk about that we haven't because I haven't thought to ask you or you haven't thought to say it or anything you're going to think about after we hang up that you wish you would have said? Uh, I'll probably think of lots of things. Yeah. Yeah. Anything that's kind of really significant to your whole story, you know, not, not that we care about stories, but. Uh, <laughs> Something that might inspire others, or you know, give them hope. And and I, I think it's kind of interesting that you've talked about so the, the the difficult times you've been through also, because that I have a well, I just discovered last night, as a matter of fact, that a very dear friend of mine who uh, I was on long meditation courses with back in the 70s, and you know, a spiritual guy all his life, he just kind of hit a, a major pothole in his life and uh, ended up getting into drinking and drugs, and he, he was found dead in a motel room recently, oh. you know, from an overdose. And uh, so I think it's, it's interesting to hear stories of people who haven't necessarily had a totally smooth ride to, to give hope to those who are 
going through difficulties and make them realize that it's not going to always be this way, that there can, you know, the clouds will clear and things can get bright again. Yes, that's absolutely true. That's absolutely true. And, you know, um, life, life is like John Lennon said, life is what happens while you're making other plans, right? Right, right. You know, and that's a very good description of what we're talking about. Mm -hmm. uh, I think the whole thing really, too, is to just to really, you know, be present for it, you know, whatever it is, whatever it is, because, mm -hmm. uh, you know... In other words, I, not try to escape it, not try to blot it out. Exactly. Yeah. That's what I did most of my life, you know, I'd drink it away, smoke it away, sex it away, whatever. Yeah. Uh, but to face, just let it come head on, mm -hmm. you know, head on, and whatever that is, uh, you know, if you don't resist it, it it'll go away. Yeah. It just seems to be the way it works, you know. Um, you know, and I would just, just, that's about it. I mean, uh, as Nietzsche said, that which doesn't kill you makes you stronger, you know. <laughs> Yeah, you know, was, I also wanted to mention a book that I, I remember reading, it just never left my mind, it was a book by uh, uh, Ram Das. Mm -hmm. I think it came out in the early 70s. Be called Here Now? Be Here Now. Sure. And you know, I've thought about that book, I had that book for years, and now it just seems like such an absurd statement. Yeah. Because He's written another one called Still Here. Uh, <laughs> well, the thing is, be here now. There's no way you can be anything but here and now. Right. You know what I mean? There's yeah. simply no. There's nothing else. You're here now. Yeah. But, e but even how do you describe now? Where is the edge of now? You know what I mean? Uh, we can get into semantics about now, uh, like Eckhart's book, The Power of Now. But really. Even that is is hard to to nail down, isn't it? It is. I think the value of that whole now thing, from what I can gather, is that it it does allow people to sort of become more present, more. Mm. You know, I, I forget the phrase you used five minutes ago, but you you know, just sort of be here for it or be be with it or something be like present. that. Be present. Be present. You know, be because present. there is a tendency, just as we can try to escape with alcohol or drugs, uh, we can try to escape by the, going into the future and the past. Exactly. You know, which you can't really get into because they don't exist. Only this yes. exists, only now exists. You know, so I think Eckhart is really good at sort of talking people into that state of presence. Yes, and he's such a wonderful speaker. Like you said, you know, it must be such a, a wonderful gift to be able to speak like that. Yeah. And in some ways, you know, you know, when you listen to you know, really good uh, people like that and Ajashanti. We were talking about how do you qualify being awake. Well, when you hear people like that, there's really no question because the words that are coming out of them, you know, they they just there's so there's so much uh, truth about it. You know. Yeah. You know what I mean? It just uh, it's universal. It's not it's not uh, addressing your preferences or your your aversions or your attachments. It's just very clear, uh, clearly spoken. You know? and I, yeah, and they're able to do that because they're obviously not locked into their own preferences or aversions or attachments. I mean, you can sort of, you know, see this sort of broad-minded acceptance and uh, flexibility with things. Not there's a real nice quote from Maharshi that I always liked in his commentary on the Gita. He he talked about humility and he said that humility is the quality of not insisting that things happen any particular way. Mm -hmm. And I think that kind of nails it. You know, it's like because if you are insisting that things happen some particular way, what does that mean? It means your ego is kind of congealing into this rigid little thing that is forcing things to you know to be in a certain way whereas the opposite of that is a relaxation of ego and 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 allowing things to happen as they happen and not insisting not arguing with reality as as Byron Katie would say right. uh, you know and it's just a it's a relaxation it's just sort of, and and that's another quality of these guys like Eckhart and Adyashanti and so on they just seem so relaxed you know they're they're smooth they're going with the flow they're not clashing 
with people or things or ideas or anything. There's just this sort of gentleness that, you know. Exactly. There's no sense of ego. There's no yeah. sense of personhood, you know. Right. It's very impersonal. And the other thing I love... And yet, they have these charming personalities That's the, at the, the same other time. At the same time, the thing that I love about those guys is their sense of humor. Yeah, you know? absolutely. They're always, having, always making a joke about things. Yeah. Uh, Swamiji, Swami Satchidananda was like that, you know, sure. he was always laughing, you know, about something, you know. Yeah, so it's all about paradox. I mean, I, I always bring that word up, but, you know, here it is, you know, very little sense of ego or there's no kind of rigid personality, and yet at the same time, that makes the personality even more vivid, even more lively, mm -hmm. you know. And yeah. being comfortable with paradox, we're another criterion, I think, of awakening that we're, we've been talking about is being comfortable with paradox, being able to sort of simultaneously embrace, you know, extreme opposites and somehow fit them into a larger context. Yes, I guess it's about being dispassionate, you know, about... I think Krishnamurti in one of his later stages in life said, I'm all right with everything. Yeah, yeah. You know, mm -hmm. uh, and that kind of wraps it up, you know. Yep. It's, know where you can be that isn't where you're meant to be. Exactly. <laughs> Whatever that might be. That's from the, what's that? All you need is love. <laughs> <clears throat> anyway, good. So uh, somehow the ma an hour and a half seems to always be the magic time for these interviews, and that's about how long we've gone. So oh. uh, we can wrap it up, but um, this has really been fun. Yes, I, I really, I'm really grateful for uh, that you invited me on here. Yeah, well, I'm glad you got in touch, and I, I'm, I'm very appreciative of anyone who actually listens to all these things as you have been doing. Do you, do you just listen to the audio, or do you watch the videos? Uh, just the audio, usually. Yeah. Yeah, because it allows me to lie on the floor. Yeah, right. Other than sit on the seat. Sure. You know, and uh, I usually do it late at night. Uh huh. And uh, just listen to it all the way through. You know. That's great. It's great. I really like it. I, I appreciate that you're doing that. <clears throat> so um, let's uh, conclude then. I've, I've been talking with Richard Laird, uh, or Rick Laird, as he was known in Mahavishnu Orchestra days. Uh, and uh, this has been Buddha at the Gas Pump. We have a weekly show. You, if you go to batgap.com, B-A-T-G-A-P, uh, you'll find all the other interviews archived and links to a number of different things such as chat groups and podcasts and YouTube videos and, and so on and so forth. This is available in, in a number of formats. Uh, so until next week, uh, be here now. <laughs>